This presentation is part of the TI in Focus AP Calculus video series. In this video, I'll discuss the solutions, relevant concepts, and scoring guidelines associated with some of the parts of our 2020 mock AP Calculus exam, Form AB, Question 1. My name is Steve Kokoska. I'm a professor at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania, and I'm a former AP Calculus chief reader. Form AB question 1 involves a continuous function f with domain minus 2 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 9. The graph of f is given, and it consists of three line segments with two quarter circles. A new function g is defined as g of x is the definite integral from 0 to x of f of t dt for x between minus 2 and 9. In part f, the student needs to find the absolute maximum value of g over the interval minus 2 to 5. Here are some key concepts that we'll need in order to answer this question. First, we'll definitely need the closed interval or table of values method, also commonly referred to as the candidate's test. This tells us how to find the maximum and minimum value for a continuous function on a closed interval, a to b. And we really need both of these conditions, continuity and a closed interval, for this method to work. We find the values of f at the critical numbers in the open interval a to b. We find the values of f at the endpoints of the interval, that is, at x equal a and at x equal b. And then we simply create a table of all of these values. And the absolute maximum value is the largest value in the table, and the absolute minimum is the smallest value in the table. And remember, the definite integral can be interpreted as net area. We've already used this concept in several previous parts of this free response question. To solve this problem, first note that g is a continuous function on the closed interval minus 2 to 5. We've already seen that g is differentiable by the fundamental theorem of calculus, and therefore g is continuous. So we need to evaluate g at the endpoints of this interval and at the critical points in the open interval. There are two critical points in the open interval minus 2 to 5, and we know this from part a. At x equal minus 1 and at x equal 2, g prime, which equals f, is 0. And we already know that g of minus 1 is equal to 1 from part d. And we know that g of 2 is pi minus 4 from part e. Now consider the endpoints. And this graph will help us visualize the value of g of minus 2. g of minus 2 is, by definition, the definite integral from 0 to minus 2 of f of t dt. Now the first thing I'll do is reverse the limits of integration and place a negative sign in front. We've used this property of definite integrals previously in this question. Now I need to find the net area associated with the function f from x equal minus 2 to x equal 0. In the graph, this is the area of the green shaded region minus the area of the blue shaded region. And both of these regions are triangles. And both of them have the same area. So the net area and the value of g of minus 2 is 0. Let's use this graph to help us find g of 5. And I'll use the idea of net area and another property of definite integrals. g of 5 is, by definition, the definite integral from 0 to 5 of f of t dt. This is the net area associated with the function f from 0 to 5. In the graph, it's the area of the green shaded region minus the area of the blue shaded region. Since we already found the area of the blue shaded region, or equivalently g of 2, I'll use a property of definite integrals. I can split the original integral into the sum of two separate definite integrals of f of t dt, the first from 0 to 2, and the second from 2 to 5. We know the first definite integral from part e. That's pi minus 4. 
The second definite integral is the area of the green shaded region, or the area of a quarter circle with radius 3. And this region is above the x-axis, so this net area is positive. Adding these two values together, I get 13 over 4 pi minus 4. Now, let's put all this information together. Here's our table of values of g for x values equal to the endpoints and the critical points. Now, you might need to convert g of 5 into a decimal to be certain about the maximum value. But after we examine all the values in this table, the absolute maximum value of g on the interval minus 2 to 5 is 13 over 4 pi minus 4. Here are the typical scoring guidelines for this type of problem. Part F was worth 4 points, 1 point for considering the endpoints, and 1 point for considering the critical points, 1 point for the answer, and 1 point for the justification. Here are some interpretations of these guidelines to help award points. The first two points are for considering the appropriate x values as possible locations for the absolute maximum. And generally the word considers is interpreted very loosely. For example, if a student simply writes g of minus 2 in their response, well, they've considered x equal minus 2. Now, if ordered pairs are presented, we can read the x values for the consideration points. To earn the answer point, the student must clearly identify 13 over 4 pi minus 4 as the maximum value, with an arrow or a box or in a sentence. And if an ordered pair is presented as the absolute maximum value, we'll read the value of f of x. The table of values here is the justification in this problem. And to earn the justification point, all the values presented in the table must be correct. We will read with the student who imports incorrect values from parts D and or part E. As long as they haven't changed the complexity of the problem, they're still eligible here for all four points. Now it is possible for a student to make an argument here using a comparison of areas. But to do this, they must include correct values of the areas presented. A table may include some additional x values. However, if it does, the student must include a reason for excluding these extra values that involves g prime of x. In part g, we need to find the value of g double prime of 6, or explain why it doesn't exist. I think the key concept needed here to solve this problem is a geometric interpretation of a derivative. That is, the derivative of a function at A is the slope of the tangent line to the graph at the point where x equals A. Let's use this very slightly modified graph of f to help solve this problem. I've placed the point 6 f of 6 on the graph. Now we know g double prime of x is the derivative of g prime of x, but we've already seen using the fundamental theorem of calculus that g prime of x is f of x. So g double prime of x is f prime of x. So g double prime of 6 is f prime of 6, which is the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f at the point where x equals 6. Looking at the graph, the slope is the slope of the line segment connecting the points 5, 3, and 7, 0. Therefore, using rise over run, f prime of 6 is minus 3 halves. The scoring guidelines for this problem are pretty straightforward. One point for the correct answer, period. An unlabeled answer here is OK, but if a student labels the answer, it must be with correct notation. And no supporting work is necessary here. Many of your students can simply look at the graph of f, do this calculation in their head, and report the correct answer. And in this particular problem, that's OK. 
However, I would still encourage students to add some minimal supporting work wherever possible. In Part H, the student is asked if there exists a value d between 0 and 2 such that g prime of d is equal to the average rate of change of g over the interval 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 2. To solve this problem, we'll need to use this very important theorem that connects continuity and differentiability. It says that if f is differentiable at a, then f is continuous at a. And the way that I often think about this is that in some sense, differentiability is a stronger property than continuity. The other concept that we'll need to use here is the mean value theorem. And this says that if f is continuous on the closed interval a to b and differentiable on the open interval a to b, then there is a number c in the open interval a to b such that f prime of c is equal to the average rate of change of f over the interval a to b. This theorem is frequently tested on the AP calculus exam, and it's used in many proofs of more advanced theorems. Because this is such an important concept, let's take a closer look at the mean value theorem. The first thing to note is that this is an existence theorem. So under certain conditions, the MVT guarantees the existence of the number C, but it doesn't tell you how to find it. <laughs> I've always felt a little let down by this, but that's the nature of an existence theorem. Rolle's theorem, which is often introduced before the mean value theorem, is actually a special case of the MVT. It says that if f of a equals f of b, that is, the value of f is the same at the endpoints of the interval, then there must be a value c in the open interval a to b where the derivative is zero. And here are two graphs to illustrate a geometric interpretation of the MVT. In this graph, the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f at p is the same as the slope of the secant line a b. And in this graph, there are two tangent lines to the graph of f at p sub 1 and p sub 2 that are parallel to or have the same slope as the secant line a b. The MVT guarantees the existence of at least one value c, but indeed, there could be more than one if the conditions of the theorem are met. Given these background concepts, let's solve this problem. Here's the definition of the function g, which is given in the question. Using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that g prime of x is equal to f of x. So that means that g is differentiable on the open interval 0 to 2, which is a subset of the open interval minus 2 to 9. And therefore, g is continuous on the closed interval 0 to 2. So by the mean value theorem, there must be a value d in the open interval 0 to 2, such that g prime of d is equal to g of 2 minus g of 0 over 2 minus 0. That means that g prime of d is equal to the average rate of change of g over the interval 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2. This problem was worth two points. One point for stating the conditions necessary to apply the mean value theorem, and then one point for reaching the correct conclusion using the mean value theorem. Here are a few interpretations of these scoring guidelines. The student must clearly establish that g is a continuous function. The most common student response in questions like this is something like, differentiable implies continuous. The next issue is subtle but very important. The student must convey that differentiability implies continuity. Simply stating that g is differentiable and continuous does not earn this point. If the response talks about continuity but doesn't earn the first point, the student is still eligible for the second point. The second point requires the student to answer yes to the original question or to provide some sort of equivalent statement. And finally, it's certainly possible to earn the second point without actually stating the mean value theorem. 
For example, if the conditions are met, differentiability and continuity, then there must be such a value d. But the student doesn't have to say that d exists because of the mean value theorem. I hope this video gives you a good idea of how to solve these problems using the necessary AP calculus concepts and a reasonable expectation of how they would be scored. We'll look at more parts of this free response question in the next video.